Good morning, everybody. We are just going to give it 30 seconds to a minute just to allow everyone to uh, get online if they've got any problems, which we did this morning. So uh, we'll just give a, a nice sort of 30 seconds to 60 seconds, if that's OK. Okay, I think we'll start the session. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Simon Millwood, Health and Safety Director for Brig UK. Thank you all for joining us today for the Respiratory Risks Protecting Our Workforce webinar. Before we begin, I just need to run through some housekeeping with you. You can see and hear us but we cannot see or hear you. Please send your questions to us via the Q&A box, which you should find at the bottom of your screen. These questions are being moderated and there'll be an opportunity for us to answer them at the end of the session. The event is also being recorded. The agenda for today's session is that we will shortly hear from Fabien Viala, the UK Country Manager for Bouygues Construction and the Chair of Bouygues UK. She will be followed by an introduction as to the importance of today's session. We will hear from Doug, who was diagnosed with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, a severe and irreversible lung condition. Andy Robbins at RVT Group will provide an overview of the types of equipment that could be used on sites to help control dust and noise. Mm -hmm. David Nash from Onsite Support will then be providing us about the last line of defence, which is PPE. <laughs> We will then finish with a Q&A session. So again, please feel free to submit your questions via the Q&A chat throughout the webinar. We will try to get through as many of these as we can at the end. I will now hand over to Fabian Viala. Fabian. Hi, Simon, and thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much for introducing this very sort of important webinar. So good morning to everyone, and it's great to see so many people on the call. Um, this week is British Lung Foundation's Love Your Lungs Week, and it's really important this year because in 2022, we continue to live with the coronavirus, um, the, the corona-19 virus, which is attacking our respiratory systems. And, and so protecting our lungs is even more important than it was before the pandemic. In December 2021, the HAC reported that every year 12,000 lung disease deaths uh, are estimated to be linked to past exposures at work. And the Labour Force Survey also indicated that there is 17,000 new cases of work-induced breathing and lung-related illnesses that are reported every year. So the health of our workforce is absolutely key, and to provide safe, healthy our working environments at Bouygues, uh, we are working with our supply chain of suppliers to set a set or to, to set a, um, a, an ecosystem of health and safety standards that help us safeguard everybody who's working on our on our building sites. So as an industry, we need to ensure that we are fully protecting our workforce against these respiratory risks um, and that we are, and this is why today we're uh, with our partners, RTV, and uh, on site to raise awareness on this critical issue. Today, you're going to help. You're going to hear from from Simon and Andy and David about information on the hierarchy of control and best practice um, for dust control guidances and examples of effective engineering controls and P P V B as as you pointed out, um, Simon. So um, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing you and uh, the three of you to hear about, you know, all the things we can do to protect our, our teams. And I want to thank everybody on the call for joining us today because it's really important. And I hope you'll find this uh, webinar very useful. So thank you and over to you guys. Thank you, Fabian. Like I said, I am Simon Millward, Health and Safety Director at Bouygues UK. We now have a short film which explains the importance of this topic.
I'm Simon Millard from Breed UK, Health and Safety Director. We're here today at Horswell Quarter to look at operational risks in relation to respiratory risk in the workplace. A very relevant topic for all companies with good health and safety being good business. Good health and safety is essential for all businesses with respiratory risks representing 12,000 deaths estimated each year in relation to occupational respiratory risk. We are going to be looking at some of the risks associated with some of the tasks and activities that are generalised on most construction projects across the UK. With silica in particular being a dust generated by many activities and represented in a lot of materials that are used within construction, bricks, tiles and mortar, it's ever so relevant now to start looking at our actions today to prevent future issues in relation to people's occupational health later on in their life. The whole spirit of today is to raise awareness and hopefully some education in relation to operatives health, safety, in particular the occupational health side of their work activities. Ideally in the world of construction and CDM we look at the hierarchy of controls. In a real world, an ideal world would be looking at eliminating the risks in the workplace. But typically, due to the nature of our work and the activities we do and the materials that are used in the construction, we often find ourselves looking at engineering controls, administrative controls and often PPE as the last resort. We have been working hard with some of the industry suppliers and our preferred supply chain partners, including RVT, in providing some engineered solutions to ensure that we protect our workers and the working environment in relation to reducing and managing the risk of respiratory diseases. Within Buig UK, we have developed a whole suite of health and safety standards, which are there to help our workforce and our site teams plan, manage and control risks within the workplace. Even with all these, it's still imperative we use opportunities like this to raise awareness, educate the workforce and drive standards in relation to improving workers' occupational health whilst working on a Buig UK site. So now that we know why we are here today and the importance of having these discussions, we will now play a short video of Doug's story. He was interviewed by his granddaughter, Alicia, who is an employed by RVT Group. Hi, Granddad. Hi. How are you feeling? That yeah, good. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, Douglas Hall, a retired construction site manager. Would you be able to give us an idea of some of the big construction projects that you've worked on over the years? I built houses, offices, shop fronts. I worked in Oxford Street on some of the shop fronts in Oxford Street. I worked on uh, schools, hospitals, uh, where I ended up in anyway, the, with the hospital I was working in. On, I ended up in there. COPD, you can't cure. It's going to get worse. From Apprentice, I started at 15. As an apprentice, you had to get down the saw pits and shovel the sawdust out and do the donkey work, cleaning up, sweeping up. <clears throat> and the dust from that was quite extensive. We didn't use PP, we didn't use anything now in them days. And, and uh, you didn't have uh, safety officers wandering around them days like you do now. But we was cutting asbestos with skill saws in the garage itself we was working in, with no extraction at all. But, uh, you know, 
it worked to you done it. Were you aware while you were working on sites of silicosis and aspergillus and all well, of these different potential lung diseases? Not in the beginning, not in the beginning. At the, uh, when, I, when I got near the end of my lifespan in the industry, I was aware of most things then. Well, it's gradually got worse and uh, I'm having more help, treatment. How is that affecting you every day? It does affect you. Uh, it's okay, take your time, Grandad. It's okay, take your time. This just makes it so real, doesn't it? And people don't realise that, you know, it does affect people in the way it has you. Like, you're my granddad and this is how it's affecting you and this is how it can affect people's dads, their, their brothers, um, anyone working in the construction industry. And people just don't understand it until it's too late. I can't breathe at all, you know, I can't do any physical exercise and uh, you lose confidence in yourself, in your abilities, it don't get better. If you could tell the guys on site today, um, you know, one thing um, or, or, you know, give them a message on, on this video call, what, what would you say to them? If you see anything on site, concerning your health, shout. 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 <laughs> Hopefully, Grandad, this, this video, this video is going to be shown to 500 construction workers. And if just a handful of them take away the message that they need to shout on site if they see something that's going to affect their health then you've made a difference yeah. and you know you're saving lives yeah. Yeah. you're not invincible it hits us all any dust going into your lungs will damage you it's a killer disease, which you can't get rid of. Every day is a struggle, and he gets so frustrated because Grandad, like your dad, did everything. He's progressed to emphysema now, so he's at the worst. Um, end of it now. This has been so difficult for me. Well, as you can see. Um, yeah, but good on him, he did it. As, as youngsters in any industry, you're uh, invincible. Nothing's going to happen to you. Wow. I think you will all agree that the health and safety standards have come a long, long way since Doug started out in the construction industry. However, the key message for me from watching that is that we all have a duty to protect our health and safety and that of others. We UK have been working with RVT Group to look at the different types of equipment that we can use on our sites to help protect our workers. Andy Robbins, Key Account Manager at RVT, is here to tell you more. Andy? Thank you, Simon. And good morning to everybody. My name is Andy and I'm a Key Account Manager here at RVT Group. And um, I'd like to thank Boigs for including us in this webinar. Um, I'd like to highlight also the relationship with um, ourselves and Boigs. We've been working with them over the years. And um, 
in a greater way and looking to um, help them protect the long term health of their workers on site and to uh, put, in, put in place control measures to do that. Now, I'd like to um, note that the um, that health really is the poor relation to safety and has been really for too long. Um, we would like to see the same attention given to health as it is given to safety. The, um, the consequences of an unprotected respiratory health can be devastating, as we saw in Doug's emotional video. And it's the duty of employees, sorry, employers, to protect the people and their environment. Now, we've got a short video now to um, looking at some of RVT's equipment in action on site, um, which are protecting the respiratory health of the workers. Hello, I'm Ted Taylor. I'm Senior Technical Consultant with RVT Group. On site with Brig today to demonstrate some best practice dust control techniques. So even before we get to site, we need to have carried out a suitable risk assessment of covering the work activities which we're planning. We need to consider construction industry guidance. We need to look at HSG 258. We need to look at the COSH regulations and the Health and Safety at Work Act to ensure that we're fully protecting our people. So we'll be looking at using the hierarchy of control eliminate the hazard by changing the process. Substitute the material or the work activity for something that's got less risk. Use an engineering control, which is equipment to take the hazard away. Administrative controls, where we're keeping the people away from the hazards. And then finally, as a last resort, using personal protective equipment. We need to understand the hazards that we're working with. We've got inhalable dust, which is something that our bodies can generally handle. That's the visible dust that we see in the air. And that will be filtered out by our nose and throat. Our bodies can handle that. It's the respirable dust that is responsible for the long-term illnesses. Things like lung cancer, COPD, and silicosis. We need to consider workplace exposure limits as set out in EH40, HSE's guidance document on exposure limits. We've got things like respirable crystalline silica with a 0.1 milligrams per cubic metre and hardwood dust at 3 milligrams per cubic metre. As these are carcinogens, we should be reducing exposure as low as reasonably practicable. So we brought three types of machine with us today. The Raptor, the Dustmaster Pro and the Wanderfilter Pro. Now the Raptor is the smallest of our dust filtration machines and has an airflow of about 1,000 cubic metres an hour. This is used for smaller activities, local works, drilling, grinding, things like that. And the Dustmaster is a larger machine, is used for more intensive activities um, with an airflow of around 2,500 meters cubed an hour. And then the biggest of the machines we bought which is the Wonder Filter, based designed around creating negative pressures in quite large work areas and handling much larger volumes of dust and that will run up to about 6,000 meters cubed an hour. Each of these machines will filter to HEPA grade and can be set up to handle hazardous materials like respirable crystalline silica. Each of the three systems that we brought to site today have three stage filtration. So you have a pre-filter, which is user serviceable. Um, site guys can remove that on a regular basis and clean it out either with a hose or using a suitable vacuum cleaner. This will get the bulk of the dust out and protect the finer filters. The second stage of filtration is a fine filter. This is often adequate if we're using low toxicity dusts. This is a disposable filter and can be simply replaced if needed. The third filter is a HEPA filter. These are individually tested and certified, and we record the test certificate number against the machine it's been fitted into as part of the thorough examination and test process that each of our machines goes through before being delivered to site. Remember, we need to capture, contain, and control. My name is Andy Robbins, Key Account Manager at the RVT Group. We've been working with Boigs for many years, helping to improve respiratory health on site. The significant projects that we've helped them on, such as the UCLH project, 
where they were installing the proton beam equipment and the area had to be completely pristine. So we're not only protecting the actual equipment being installed, but the workers' health um, on site. Then across to the Cardiff University, there's various challenges they face there with, with dust, which we provided bespoke solutions for. Then there's the Cambridge project, the Cavendish 3 project, which we've been doing a lot of work with them on managing their dust, managing their noise, and general site health. Hazards on site aren't mutually exclusive. Often you'll find a dusty activity is a noisy activity. Therefore, we combine solutions that manage the dust and the noise together. The Soundex acoustic cutting enclosure protects site workers from noisy activities, while the extraction protects them from the dust. The HSE recommends using dust vacuums to remove dust from the floor rather than using a broom. A broom creates an abundance of airborne dust, while a correctly specced M or H class dust vac will maintain safe dust levels. Thank you for watching the video. We, you, you saw in, the, in the, the video the various equipment demonstrated dust, Dustex Raptor, the Dustmaster Pro and the Wonderfield Pro that RVT offer to control hazardous dusts. However, we also offer a wide range of other dust control equipment. Here we see the Hydromist um, examples. These are dust suppression units designed to provide targeted controlled water suppression to manage airborne dust with different water tank sizes, throw capabilities ranging from 10 to 60 meters, you're able to protect these, those on site from airborne dust generated from a wide range of construction and demolition site applications. Now we'll look onto um, the dust vac range. Um, here are a couple of examples. We supply a large range of certified industrial vacs, dust vacs. As mentioned in the video, we advocate ban the broom. A sweeping on-site can cause large amounts of dust to become airborne. Our durable M and H class dust vacs safely manage settle dust and debris in line with HSC guidelines. Then moving on to um, fume, um, dust isn't the only respiratory hazard and we need to bear that in mind. Fume is also particulate and poses a significant threat. As such, we offer static and mobile welding fume filter kits, as well as kits suitable for controlling volatile fumes. We then look at exhaust. Exhaust fumes generated from diesel plant on site can be extremely dangerous and should be controlled at every opportunity. RVT offer um, hire of heavy duty particulate diesel filters that reduce diesel emissions by 95%. Then we look at enclosures. As I mentioned in the video, hazards on site aren't mutually exclusive. With dust, you get the noise and sometimes fume and so on. Our enclosures don't only block and control the sound waves of noise, but some models can also be used in conjunction with dust or fume extraction and the filtration solutions, creating a multi-hazard control solution. Part of RVT's um, support to, to construction sites and construction companies is the educational resources. We are driven by providing effective respiratory hazard solutions, but we are also passionate about educating managers and their site teams about the dangers of hazards and the ways they can be controlled. We offer free toolbox talks covering everything from general construction dust to the management of radon and, and benzene gases. We also offer in-depth white papers and best practice guides. All these resources are available from our website. We also offer free CPD UK approved presentations, which can be presented in person or online to your team. These are one hour sessions to provide comprehensive introductions to different hazards and sectors. All attendees will receive a certificate of achievement and when they have completed the session, to book a CPD presentation with your team, you can visit our website or give us a call. I'd like to thank you everyone for listening and um, say goodbye and we look forward to hearing from you going forward.
Thanks, Andy. We will circulate links to the educational resources covering respiratory hazards after the event. We are now going to hear from David Nash, Strategic Relationship Manager at Onsite Support, who provides PPE, welfare and safety products to the industry. David. Thank you very much for the introduction, Simon. Um, just really wanted to uh, spend the next few minutes focusing on respiratory protection. Uh, so my thanks to uh, WE for the opportunity, fellow presenters, and for the contributions from people like the HSE, the British Lung Foundation, uh, some of our manufacturing partners, and, and many others. So um, just wanted to, uh, before we move on to a, a short video, just go through a, a few little highlights. Um, respiratory protective equipment is clearly an essential part of um, anything that you do as part of your PPE. The HSE define um, RPE, respiratory protective equipment, as a particular part of your personal protective equipment, your PPE, and it's designed to protect you, the wearer, from breathing any harmful substances or from oxygen deficient atmospheres. Then controls, as has been previously outlined, are either not possible or insufficient on their own. And that protection, as Andy mentioned, isn't just about particles, it's also about gases and vapours, and also about um, environments where there is um, a lack of sufficient oxygen. And the important thing to remember in all of this is that the smaller the particle, the easier it will be for you to inhale, deep into your lungs, where, where it will remain and cause um, damage. And therefore exposure, even in the short term, um, can result in some long-term um, implications. And so, um, when exposed to certain hazardous substances over time, it can cause life-changing um, de and de dehabilitating um, symptoms, as we've seen um, in, in Doug's case. Um, and so, you know, you, you can't intervene too early. And particularly in the construction industry, we face with the headline things like asbestos and silica, but we shouldn't forget about the other substances that we'll encounter, such as MDF and other um, particles and vapors. So I'd like to share with you um, uh, a little short video. Um, and just if you if we view this in the context of the Health and Safety Work Act and the management of health and safety and work regulations, uh, because obviously these are considerations that need to be borne in mind in terms of our, our legal obligations. So let's just play the video. Three most important things to remember are what job that you're actually undertaking um, so whether that's cutting grinding drilling um, the second thing is then to understand what the risks are um, and refer to the risk assessments for the particular job that you're doing and the third thing is also to refer to WIG UK's health and safety standards to ensure that you're in compliance with those things as well. There are principally three types of respiratory protection. There are your disposable single use, um, which come in a number of different types. The second thing are half masks, which are reusable. And the third thing would be a powered air, um, fed air, which gives positive air pressure behind a mask. And those things may or may not incorporate eyewear. First thing is whether or not you've been face fit tested and you should be face fit tested in order to select the right type of um, respiratory protection. And the second thing is to make sure that when you are selecting that type of respiratory protection, you're um, looking for uh, the risk assessment and making sure that you're selecting the right type of mask that fits your, your face and the job that you'll be doing. The three things that you should look for are protection, fit and comfort. Whether it complies with the UK regulations, whether it is fit for purpose and whether or not it actually fits you and is comfortable in use. Uh, fit testing is an independent, qualified individual checking that the product that you're about to use is fit for purpose and that individual should be competent, experienced and also qualified in order to undertake that assessment for you. 
what a face fit test does for you is make sure that the mask actually fits your face correctly and provides a good, solid and adequate seal to your face. And also it makes sure that it's fit for purpose. You should do a fit test um, before you start and commence any job involving um, any respiratory challenges and certainly before any equipment is issued to you. And that fit test should be repeated periodically according to WE UK's guidelines um, and any risk assessments. And certainly if you're issued with a new type of equipment, a new type of respiratory protection, you should also undertake a face fit test before that. One of the other really important considerations is that we all want to make sure that we go home safely to our loved ones. And so we have a duty of care not only to ourselves, but also to the others around us. And that shared commitment is to the health, safety and well-being of the people that we work with and of ourselves. Just really wanted to cover off a, a couple of other things um, that, um, and highlight a couple of things that have been uh, talked about in the video. Clearly, when we're talking about RPE, we're talking about um, respiratory um, uh, air purifying uh, devices, which are known as uh, filtering devices, uh, or breathing apparatus, which then is designed to provide an independent supply of air, um, particularly um, applicable where you have the risk of oxygen deprivation. Uh, so. Those type of um, tight-fitting face pieces, also known as, as face masks, um, are designed to provide that type of filtration. And they're also loose-fitting face pieces, which are designed to, uh, with, um, to provide a powered air, so positive air pressure. Um, and they could be hoods, helmets, visors, and other things of that nature. The other important element is to consider the type of filtration, whether it's a particulate filter or a gas or vapor filter. And um, those filters will be labeled in accordance with that um, EN standard uh, 14387. Uh, um, and they, therefore you will encounter filters that will be either labeled P for particulates or ABEK, otherwise known as uh, ABEC filters to um, give you protection against things like um, uh, gases, vapors, um, and bacteria and, uh, and viruses and those type of um, things that you may also encounter on a construction site. So just um, in the video, we also talked about comfort. I just really wanted to, uh, to focus on some of the excuses that are often used for not wearing um, the, uh, the, the right type of respiratory equipment. People talk about it being awkward to work with, interfering with your other PPE, um, people you work with never wear it um, and never have any problems. Um, and the other thing is that people often say, um, you don't like to shave, and obviously that's a problem for me. Um, but the point about wearing up um, PPE and RPE is that it's there to protect you. Um, and therefore it is critically important that you don't ignore um, the, the fact that you need to, um, to protect your, your respiratory system because excuses won't protect you at the end of the day. And particularly in, in, in the current climate where you have hot um, weather, um, you know, there are lots of different types of PP with exhaust valves on them or fed air solutions that will provide you with a greater degree of comfort uh, when facing some of the challenges that, uh, that, uh, that you may face around the site. And also really want to just to move on to just focus a little bit on the HSE guidance um, because uh, it is important to take the advice not only of the manufacturers um, instructions that you're given with, with the PPE, but also to look in, in general terms at the HSE guidance. So um, it is important to be clean shaven at the start of your shift. It is always, um, always necessary to check the fit before every use, particularly around the nose and chin, and also to check the position of the straps. And also as previously discussed, to carry out a face fit test. Um, and that includes making sure that um, you can then get a snug fit around, around your face. And the other part of um, the using RPE is to make sure you maintain it properly. If you look after it, it will look after you. So before use, always check that you have a good seal. Make sure the straps have got good elasticity. Um, make sure that you um, routinely check for any distortion, any damage, any cracks, tears, wears, or defective parts um, in the product that you're about to use before you use it. And therefore, where if it is a, a reusable product, to regularly clean and maintain it and put it away safely and correctly. 
Um, the manufacturers will supply you with bags um, to store the equipment in, and that's designed to prevent dust getting inside the mask for the next time that you use it. And the last thing I want to just um, cover off um, is um, the business around um, just to remember a few simple things. When so select, it, the first of which is to select the right solution. So that's the right type of mask, the right type of filtration for, for the hazards that you might encounter, and also the right size of mask so it fits your face. And that means getting fit tested. As daft as it sounds, don't ever be tempted to remove the mask in a hazard area. And if in doubt, follow the HSE guidance to stop, look, assess, and then manage the situation. And if in any doubt whatsoever, seek professional advice so that you can remain um, and stay healthy. Thank you for your time. Thank you, David. Um, that brings us to the end of the presentations and on to the Q&A session. Um, the first question uh, that we have is uh, an anonymous uh, question. So please, again, um, if you do want to put a question through live, um, then obviously uh, you have the facility at the bottom of your screen. So an on anonymous question, I think this is more relevant for uh, Andy. How do I know if I need dust extraction? Thank you, Simon. That's a, a very, very good question. And um, I think we all need to understand that any grinding, cutting, sanding, breaking activity will create dust. Um, and that, uh, some dust extraction, filtration will be needed. Um, even the dust that you cannot see, um, you might think there's no dust in the air, there's, there's no problem, but it's that dust that's the, that's the real, the, the critical one. That's the invisible to the naked eye. You can't see it with the naked eye. And that's the dust that is hanging in the air that's the dust that is getting into the into the deep lung. As, as David mentioned, the smaller the, the particulate, the, the easier it'll, it will be to um, get into, into the lung. And then that's, that's where it does its damage. So essentially anything that is grinding, cutting, sanding, breaking will need extraction, dust extraction and filtration. Thank you, Andy. Hopefully that uh, answers the question sufficiently uh, for the person who put that one in, but good question. Um, we have one from uh, Lisa Gibson. Um, looking forward to this, David. Um, this is how do you navigate the refusing to shave? That's a great question, as you can see from for me. Uh, thank you for that one. Um, the uh, issue about refusing to shave um, could be a born of a number of different um, things. It could be a religious thing. It could be a personal choice, as is as is the case in in my case. Um, that. However, there are plenty of solutions which are fed air solutions that um, can be used from a number of different manufacturers that will allow you to provide the right product, kind of respiratory protection for an individual who chooses or um, for whatever reason not to shave. Um, and buying and seek advice um, from the, your um, health and safety professional in your organization in the first instance, and then by all means, um, look to people like ourselves to offer you the, the advice as to what could be a potential solution to, to make that situation. Thank you, David. Uh, again, hopefully that's a very, uh, answer that very uh, difficult question for you personally, David. Um, we have um, some more that have come in, again, anonymous. Um, so I'm gonna pitch this to the relevant person on the panel, which I think we'll just play left and right on this one, which will be Andy again. What is the best approach to effective dust control? Thank you, Simon. That's an ex excellent question there. And um, there's many different approaches, I guess. And it will also it'd have to assess what, what the actual activity is, which is where RVT can come in and, and provide that support and that advice. Um, using our three C's methodology, which um, the audience will remember in the video earlier, um, my colleague Ted Taylor went through those. There's, um, it's very easy to remember. Um, three C's are capture, contain, and control. And in very simple, simple terms, the, the, the three C's are, so the capture is, is capturing the dust at source so before it can spread to the wider environment and then obviously affect others that are, that are working around. The contain element is to reduce the, the size of your work area, um, minimize it, bring it under a more of a manageable size. And then the control is, um, is to put the actual area you're working in under a negative pressure. So RVTs are, you know, our expertise is to work with that, um, 
support and provide advice and help you implement those um that that methodology i hope that um that helps with that, with that question simon yeah yeah very good very comprehensive thank you very much uh andy um hopefully a nice uh easier one for you this time uh david when should the employer provide rpe again that's a, an anonymous question on that one at the end of the day every employer has a legal responsibility to provide the rights of um, protective equipment and that is then mirrored by the responsibility of the employee the individual also then to use the equipment that's being provided to them so hopefully that will um, answer that question indeed it did thank you very much um a nice long question here from uh adrian cook uh, quite aptly i think this one goes uh, back to you uh andy um, so I'll just read this as it's came through live. Uh, can your equipment be adapted to suit when drilling or grinding at height? A lot of trades are drilling soffits, concrete on columns and beams, working of towers, podiums, etc. From the products in the slides and presentations, they all appear to be floor mounted. Thank you, Simon, and thank you, Adrian, for that, for that question. Um, very good question. And yes um, our, our equipment can be modified to, to suit um, what we would look at doing is um, where you've got the capture hood we would mount a a magnetic foot which can be clamped to the the cage of the podium or or the um the mute or whatever's being used then that will get that capture hood as close as possible um to, to the actual source of the dust with the um maybe the, the Raptor unit, the small Raptor unit, which is portable, that can be um, taken up with, with you in, in the cage on the MUP. But in answer to that, yes, yes, we can modify and, and support on that one. Thank Hope you that very helps. much. Thank you very much, Andy. Thank you very much. Um, I, thought, I suppose this is a, a joint one, really. It's uh, again from a, an anonymous uh, attendee. Is site support and education something that on-site and RVT would offer on respirator, respiratory risk protection? So that is, a question, that is a question to, to both of you. So uh, if you want to go first, David. Thank you. Um, I, I think as Andy um, alluded to in, in his video and his presentation, 100% yes. Um, more than happy to provide, whether it's toolbox talks or um, if it's a specific challenging question, we'll drag experts in from the various manufacturers to afford, so we can make sure that we make sure give you the right recommendations to provide you with the right solutions and also um, to help with that education piece too. Always happy to do that. Fantastic, Andy. Yeah, th thank you very much, Simon. Absolutely, and um, as David said, I'm um, one of RVT's passions is to provide that that education, that support on site. Um, we will come down, um, meet meet the team on site, discuss through the challenge, and then put forward a a solution to that. So yes, support is is there. We we understand that not every challenge has a straightforward answer. So we you know we we look to support. Um, th no, through the through the whole pr procedure, and in terms of education, absolutely, you've got the um, the CPD approved presentations, or we could do um, a presentation that's more tailored to your individual site, looking at the challenges, and then to, you know, work around those and give you the give the support that you're looking for. Yeah, and I would personally encourage um, everyone who's on the call to try and take uh, both uh, David on site support and the an RVT group up on their offer because they do provide some fantastic interactive uh, learning sessions. So that's great for when you've got um, busy projects um, and you want to have that up close and personal interaction. So that's fantastic. Um, whilst we were doing the, the, the sort of duo uh, question set, there's one more here, which uh, has been um, again, anonymous attendee. So uh, that one's just come in now. So this one is to both presenters. Um, David, if you could answer it first and then it will go over to uh, Andy. When you wear FFP3 dust masks, which is claimed uh, an optimum protection, which method do we adopt? PPE or dust extraction? Um, as it has been discussed, you really need to look at that um, hierarchy. So the PPE is always then the last line of defense. Um, and so therefore um, you really need to make sure it is the last line of defense. Um, and you need to take every other measure prior to that before resorting to PPE in order to protect you. Thank you, David. Over to Andy. Thank you very much. Um, a yeah, very good question there. Um, quite rightly, as David points out, the um, on the, the PPE being a last line of defence, 
which which can't be ignored. But um, what I would say there is, you, um, the extraction would be an additional measure. And again, look at it in its own rights. Often we find where um, in someone's RAMs they need um, PPE, but extraction is not mentioned. And that, that could then actually affect what they're doing themselves, that the work is actually affecting others in the work area. So adding the extraction element just to control the more the environment, their immediate environment, capture the, any, any dust that, that's, that's escaping or is in the air, um, even if it's fume from, from welding perhaps, um, I, would, I would really say, I would say both, but again, it's all the question of the, um, the risk management and the- Yeah, that's, no, a, that's a fair point, Andy, thank you very much. Um, I do apologize uh, to the anonymous attendee who posted a question at 9.39. It seems to have come through um, slightly distorted uh, on the screen for me with the words. I'm gonna try and uh, in, interpret the question, uh, what I think is being asked. Uh, and I'll ask this one to uh, David. If works are creating uh, dust in a working area, should everyone have a mask or should the area be closed off? Um, that's a really tough question to answer without actually having sight of the particular circumstances. Yeah, yeah. Um, and therefore it is imperative that if you think there's a risk that you should refer to the risk and method statements that have been um, detailed prior to commencing any work, um, because that is really your, your primary guidance um, in terms of whether or not um, the area should be closed off and whether or not anybody that's within that area or adjacent to that area needs any kind of protection. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you touched on it in your in your slides and presentation, David. Fundamentally, under the management regs, we have to risk assess. So that should be part of that risk assessment process. Absolutely. Um, I think this one is more relevant, obviously, to uh, Andy. Um, what is the best method to control dust during sanding, rubbing down, for decorating activities. And again, um, that's a, a non anonymous attendee, but hopefully the, the person is still with us live. Thank you, Simon. Uh, again, another very good question there. What we would look to do is um, potentially using the, the dust master, sorry, the, the Raptor unit, which is a more reportable unit, um, is to capture that dust at source. Um, so you, if you're sanding, you'd very likely have on tool extraction. But again, um, there is still dust in the air from that activity that that on tool extraction doesn't capture everything. So we would look to use additional um, extraction in the background. There could also be an option, if possible, putting that room that you're working in under a slight negative pressure. That just means you're extracting air out of that room faster than it can, can be replaced. And that actually is containing that dust within that room. It doesn't migrate to, to the rest of the, the property or wherever you're working. Thank you very much, uh, Andy, on that one. Um, I'm just going to put this one over to uh, David. I think it's quite in line with the previous one on when should the employer provide RPE. Um, this one is, are temporary workers exempt from the provision of PPE and RPE? Uh, very quick and simple answer is no. Everybody should be protected regardless of um, how they're employed. Um, and um, therefore it is imperative that everybody is, uh, is protected re regardless of who they are and what, what role they're doing on the project. Thank you very much for that. Um, we have, uh, they're all anonymous by the way, so hopefully uh, everyone is uh, sort of still with us. Um, this one I think is to both of you um, from what I can sort of uh, glean from this one. How do I know if the filters are the correct ones and are working correctly and effectively. So I think that goes both for PPE in RPE and also for uh, extraction units, which uh, Andy uh, showcased uh, in the uh, previous slides. So if I could go to uh, Andy first on that one. Thank you, Simon. Um, with, the, with the filters, we, we obviously would definitely always recommend that they're checked regularly and replaced if needed while the equipment is in use. Now, what I would suggest is you check with the, um, the provider of the equipment, particularly if you're hiring it, that they fitted new filters at the, you know, before they dispatched it. And also make sure that they actually checked it. So something that RBT, we, we, as a policy, we always fit brand new filters. Um, and then I think in the video earlier, 
you record 10 mentioned that um, we record the serial numbers of the filters and that's all logged and then we put the equipment through a thorough examination in terms of which filters are best uh, again that is a conversation we would have before we even provided anything so we would understand what dust it is who's who you know who needs to be protected so we can actually recommend and, and fit the, the correct filters but our, we, know we, we are here to help you support and provide that advice hope that helps fantastic i think this one uh, again anonymous uh, just came in uh, quite quite a poignant one in relation to uh, people's behaviors uh, but this one is i believe most Operative managers are aware of the dangers of construction dust, but how do we approve, improve, sorry, uh, upon the behavioral aspects? Operatives go from site to site and bring with them various poor uh, behaviors from not so diligent projects. So quite a provocative uh, question there. Um, I suppose um, I'll put my slant on that from a personal uh, perspective. I think everyone should be aware of their own personal responsibilities, not only for their own health and safety and others but under the health and safety at work act um but i think the best we can do when we have our own projects to manage and people to look after uh, and to safeguard is ensure we have uh, effective communication information and awareness uh, sessions such as this uh, or sessions such as rbt and on site uh, can provide live onto those projects it's about informing and educating uh, behaviors or behavioral aspects is a very deep uh, area to touch upon um, but I think through effective monitoring controls within the workplace hopefully we can pick up these behaviors at source and then educate uh, and hopefully improve those um, that would be my take on that uh, I don't know if uh, Andy or uh, David would have anything to add on that I think there's um, if I may interject is um, uh, behavioral um, change is, is, a, is a challenge but we have a, a responsibility not only to ourselves but also to the people around us um, so if you do see something you should um, not only be confrontational about it because obviously it doesn't help anybody um, just share what you believe to be best practice and if in any doubt refer to the health and safety um, leadership that's on that particular project thank you um there is one unfortunately david i think this just sort of flips back to you um hopefully covered off in your slides but obviously the qu the question has been asked anonymously nonetheless so uh deserves an answer nonetheless why is respiratory protection so important and necessary um respiratory protection um as we've seen really from doug's video i mean i think that really tells the story um the the challenge is that before you know it, it could already be too late. Um, and therefore you need to be, um, take the best steps possible in line with the advice that you're given um, and, and the protective equipment you've been given and whether that's environmental protection or your personal protection. Um, because as I say, you can't be too careful. Thank you on that one, absolutely. Um, we have one more uh, anonymous question is, uh, uh, let's, I suppose, even though it looks more towards the extraction side of it, I think really, um, I think that's the more relevant one for Andy, uh, but do you provide upfront planning and support in relations to the elimination of risk in the workplace? Thanks, Simon. Yes, in answer to that, um, absolutely. We um, provide a lot of advice upfront when, if it's a, a tender or you're you know, you're going through the design stage and there's obviously aware of risks involved the the process is going to cause the, the the hazards so we would engage we put forward some suggested methodology some plans suggested equipment and hopefully then that, that can be built into maybe the tender package the wording and ultimately um, we would like to think that would be you know help you be successful in winning that in that that project because you've shown some thought some you've got some good um, methodology in there and solutions and uh, some, uh, some pre thought gone in there in, in providing the protection so yes absolutely the support all the way uh thank you very much we've got a a, a very a poignant one from uh, dean murphy uh which is just coming as well so i think this is really for uh suppliers uh to the industry it'd be sort of good to get your uptake uh, and insights into maybe providing an answer to this if i start with 
uh, David, do you feel the industry training does enough for education on health and in particular respiratory protection, both at management and trade levels, for example, CITB, CSCS? Um, I think the simple answer is you, this is one area of um, protection where you cannot overprotect and therefore I don't think you can ever do enough um, uh, in order to educate on, on health, um, which is why initiatives like today are fantastic. Um, the focus the British Lung Foundation um, has put um, on, on respiratory protection and particularly the uh, leadership from the HSC is, is critical to make sure that uh, A, awareness is, is heightened, but then um, also then there is a lot of information that's available through those bodies and also through responsible manufacturers um, in order to provide the uh, the education. But yes, more can be done at every at every level. And it, um, yeah, I, I, I would totally agree. Uh, Andy, would you uh, add anything on to that? Thanks, Simon. I can't really add too much. I fully agree with what, what's been said, um, that you, you can't do too much. Um, what we're looking to do today is protect that the health down down the road when, when um, no, the effects of poor health don't necessarily come out immediately if from these hazards, they're, they're later. So we want to put everything we everything we can, all the energies we can now in protecting that health to enjoy your life later. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and again, um, with the dog video, um, there is that element still within the industry of invincibility, isn't there? So, uh, you know, when we do see these uh, activities, mm -hmm. it's, it, it, you know, stop, as Doug said, stop. Um, I suppose we've got time for one more light one before the uh, session ends, and this is a, a, a nice light one um, in, in relation to finishing the, the event off with. Um, again, it's a joint question. I'll sort of revert it to, uh, to uh, David first. Uh, what are the best contact details for RVT and on site if I would like to get in touch for support? Um, uh, we're easy to find um, on site support. Um, .co.uk um, and that means that you can get in contact with us um, that we have uh, news and information and as RVT do also have um, a lot of other uh, resources at our disposal so use on site support.co.uk as um, your initial point of contact. And that was an anonymous uh, question but I'll just suppose I'll, I'll I'll expand on that just in case there's others that I think in they'd like to take you up on that offer are there any geographical uh, restrictions in on-site support uh, David no none whatsoever fantastic uh, Andy for RVT thank you Simon so again very easy to find a simple google of RVT group will bring us up and again we cover nationwide north south east west and I'm, I'm not sure whether we'd be sending some details out afterwards, but uh, you know, we can do to anybody that needs it, some details on how to contact us, but yeah, very easy to find. I think, yeah, I think both by the uh, power of Google, um, you, you can be found quite easy, can't you? So that's that's fantastic. Um, okay, we, we're, we're sort of right towards the uh, the end of the session now. So what I would like to personally say, and from uh, on behalf of all the other uh, guest speakers is thank you to everyone who has attended this session. Uh, we really do hope that you have found the information and the interaction interesting. Uh, we will certainly follow up with any questions uh, that we will not be able to uh, answer during the event, uh, and that will hopefully come out with a, a, a sort of a feedback uh, Q&A. So for myself personally, I'd like to thank everyone for taking their time out, especially during uh, busy times and, and train strikes to, to attend the session uh, and be part of something where we're trying to aspire the awareness and the education within the industry on a very relevant subject matter. Thank you very much.